So you want to find out who owns that vacant house, but you also need to know what will that house be worth once it's fixed up, AKA ARV, which means after repair value. Well, I'm going to show you how. Stand by, let's get it. Hello guys, this is Ty, A.K. The Flip Man. We're looking at here is Day Later, A.K. Prop Stream. And what I wanted to show you today using this tool is number one, determine who is the owner for a particular property, but also to show you how to determine the ARV, the after repair value, which simply means what will the house appraise for in excellent condition. You must always know this before you can even start to know if you have an opportunity or not. Now you have to take the other factors in, into play to be able to determine that, but you gotta know that. There's just, just no way around it because you have to think in the terms of how, if I wholesale this property, how will the investor make their money? So, and I'm going to uh, break down the quote unquote formula that a lot of people use to try to determine if they have an opportunity or not. The formula is not set in stone, but for me, and the way I like to teach it, is more used for, obviously for people starting out, it helps them out a great deal because it seems like just from my experience of dealing with students, non-students, that's the hardest thing is for them to actually know what a deal is or not. And so this will help you to, to determine that. Now, the I'll break that down later on in this video here, but I want to start with just looking at some properties in a couple of different markets to number one, show you how simple it is just to look up the owner using this service. And remember, as of the date of this video, this daily latest AK prop stream tool is best used on a PC or laptop. It uh, is not as mobile and or tablet friendly right now. You can pull it up, but it just doesn't, it's called uh, it being responsive. It's just not as responsive as it should be, but we're working on that. Okay, so the first thing you want to do is, oh, and yeah, if you if you want the service, obviously you can go to digulator.com. You can see the pricing there. I won't quote it here, but it's going to go up, you know, shortly after this video, it goes up. So if you had it before and you canceled it and you say, oh, wow, I didn't know you can do this, or now I can see how I can use it, you may want to re-up because it's gonna go up from the, the bottom line price that it is right now. I'm just letting you know, it's up to you. But you know, once it goes up, it's up, you know, but the one and the people that already have signed up and are paying for it, you're locked in at the price that you're paying for it. So just understand that, but it still has the uh, five day free trial. All right, so let's start with the first address here. I already have one that I can just copy and paste in here. This is out in Long Beach, California. Okay, and so uh, the first thing you want to do, now I have my tabs up here uh, set up the way I want them, but whenever you get into the service and you watch some of the other videos that I have, you can see how to set those up. Which I won't really be using any of these for this particular video. So I put a, a, here's the address, which you can see over here, and then you can see some general information here, which it offers um, the average comps in the area, which is 522. Um, I'm just not going to automatically go by that because a lot of times, depending on the market and or the property that you're targeting, is going to take in consideration higher comps, lower comps, and obviously the ones in the mid middle. So what I'm going to always be looking for is consistency. But before I get into that, let me go ahead and show you how simple it is just to determine who the owner is according to what records are being produced by that particular courthouse or city 
because this information is only going to be as current as how they produce and make it available to the public. I don't care what service you're using. All right. So you hit details. So boom, here you go. It pulls up uh, that information as far as the owner over here to the left. Uh, I'm going to try to zoom in on it. So boom, you can see it there to the left here. All right. And then uh, you have the other tabs. So you have the comparables and nearby uh, listings. If this was an MLS listed property, this uh, MLS tab would be here also. You have the tax information. I didn't select the MLS information, which we're going to get into that to determine ARV. And then you're going to have the tax information on the property. Uh, so the assessed value that the, uh, let me zoom in here. So the assessed value of this property is uh, the 525. All right. And so um, you have your mortgage information. So it shows uh, they recently got a mortgage on this property for 406. See, all of this information is powerful whenever you're trying to research a property and knowing if you have an opportunity here. Once we get into the value of this property, hopefully I'll remember to, to, to know that that 406 because that'll affect whether you have a deal or not. And a lot of people ask the question, well, what happens to a mortgage or a lien or whatever? Nothing happens to it. They have to be paid in order to do a transaction, but they matter, but they don't matter. As long as the prices, the price of a mortgage or liens are less than the price that you need to make the deal work, it doesn't matter. Most owners, not all, but most owners understand that if we did a deal on this property, we'll just say for $500,000, they only going to walk away with 94000 which is the difference of 500000 and 406000 because that four or six has to be paid off. And so instead of them getting a check for $500,000, they will only get a check for $94,000. Okay, so in the transaction history, you're going to see much of the same. But when the actual recording occurred, like this is 930 right here, September 30th, over here is going to be the same thing in a lot of cases. So, and then it'll go back. This goes back all the way to 2000 on this particular property as far as transaction history. Now, the documents and reports, that'll just depend on your market, on how detailed that information is, but a lot of times you might not need to use that information. So to determine the owner, it's just on the right hand of the property details. And as you can see, the actual mailing address is the same as the actual address that we're looking at. So whenever you're looking at a vacant house and you pull up the information on the owner, you always want to look at the mailing address because sometimes that's going to be the only way that you may have an opportunity to actually reach out to them to see if they're interested in selling the property. So if the mailing address is different, then boom, uh, that's a that's a, a check in your favor because now there's a possibility that you can reach out to them and you may have an opportunity to see if they're interested in selling and obviously it goes from there to see if the price works uh, in your favor if you all negotiate a, a deal. Now, if the address is the same, then that's when a little bit more due diligence may have to come into play by simply asking the neighbors. You may do a search on this person's name with the address through some of the inexpensive skip tracing services such as Intellus. That's Intellus.com. And you'll want to look for possible uh, relatives. And then you may you can reach out to a relative or find their information easier and give them an incentive uh, to this particular person to see if they may be interested in selling the property. When I say an incentive, let them know that you may pay them a $500 or $1,000 if you do a deal on it, if you actually buy the house. Same thing with the neighbors, because a lot of times they'll know what's going on. They may even know how to reach the owner or a relative of the owner. So that's the part of who is the owner. So you go here, you put in the address, just to go back. I put in the address up here to the top left. Then I hit details, and boom, the, the property details you'll see the owner information over here to the bottom left and then as i said you want to look at the mailing address to see if they're the same if it's a situation where the property is vacant now right here it tells you the occupancy is owner occupied if it's not owner occupied or if it's an absentee property then it'll say non-owner occupied and if you don't know what absentee means it simply means that they own the property but they don't live in it you can only have one homestead any additional uh, properties that someone owns is considered 
absentee. And the reason we target absentee, we're just playing numbers here. It's more likely they'll want to sell the house that they don't live in or have issues with than the one that they actually live in. It's just a numbers game. Nothing's guaranteed, just a numbers game. Okay, we determine how and who owns the property by using the tool here. All right, so since we're in this tab here, we're going to go to comparable sales. All right, now whenever, let me go back, let me go back to this screen here. Now it's going to give you some comparables down here, which is harder to see in full view. What you'll want to do is you hit the details and then hit comparables. Okay. All right. So now it's going to have eight comps here, which is a decent amount of comps for this property. So you have your com comparable sales map over here. And when I say comps, it's just short for comparable sales. Okay. All right, so what I like to do is, is a couple of things that you can do. All right, and sometimes this information may not be as detailed because it, it's, it's only going to pull up sales that have occurred within a certain time frame. Now, the way we have it set right here is the distance is only a half a mile. All right, the time frame of, of sales is an entire year from from August 14th of 2017 to August 14th of 2018. Now you can change this if you want to be something a little closer to now, say in the last 90 days. All you have to do is just go ahead and change it. Choose a date. Move the year up. Just keep going. Move the year up to, to we'll just say July if you wanted to. Only, only 30 days or so. So it's totally up to you on how you want to handle that. Okay. And then with the distance, sometimes you may have to go out beyond just a half a mile, you may have to go up to a mile. Normally, appraisers will try to stay within a mile. They really want to try to stay at the closest a, a half a mile because that'll give them a true idea of what the actual, uh, what's going on as far as residential property selling in that particular uh, area. Okay, so just wanted to explain that. Then you can change the square footage if you want to get closer to your square footage, the number of bedrooms, the baths also, but I just leave it as any. Okay, because it's normally just going to default to being in a certain range as far as the uh, the uh, square footage and the number of beds and baths, but it's more important about the square footage. Okay, so what I like to do is, is I like to go over here to the sales amount, and hit it twice, and I want to go from high to low. And what I'm looking for here, and I'm going to blow this up a little bit. Okay, what I'm what I'm looking for here is consistency. Okay, so we see 650, we see 595, we see 565, we see 531, we see 530. All right, the consistent, consistent, then we see 485, 440, 380, as you see. The consistency for me is the 530, the 531, the 565. That's my range. Now, I can pull a number out of any of that. I can say 565 and I'll be comfortable with that. Because the square footage on this property is 1304. You see over here to the left, it's 1304. And the houses that we're looking at down here, all of those are in the same range from 1365, 1345, 1236. All of that's close enough. So I would probably go ahead and go with this, uh, this five, uh, well, I probably would say 550 on this, knowing me. Okay, but the 565 would be okay too, or whatever. But basically, it's uh, sales per square feet. You can look at it right here. That's another way of determining. It looks like the sales per square foot is in that 420, which got lower, but 420 to 481. So if you did the math on that, it'll come out in this range right here. So I would probably go with 550 on this particular property if it were me uh, trying to come up with a value. And so now what, what it's actually estimating that it, uh, is 617. But I like to try to be a little conservative on my numbers. Whenever an investor looking at it, he may think it's worth the 617, which is fine or whatever, just make it even more attractive to him. But I like to be a little bit more conservative than, than, uh, just going just flat out with the higher end of it. Okay. So, uh, so there you go. So that's one property that we're going to look at. So let's look at another one. So to look at another property, I'm going to clear 
And then we're going to, I'm going to go to Nashville, Tennessee on this one. Okay, so boom. So here's the address here. So I'm going to hit details. Again, uh, look at the owner. All right, the mailing address is actually different than the address of the, of the target property. Okay, that's a, that would be an opportunity if this property was vacant. Okay, the estimated value that they're giving is 187. I just don't want to go by that. I want to dig into the comps myself. Let me look at the transaction history. All right, it looks as if they paid uh, back in March uh, 155 for this particular property. Okay, there's some other history here. All right, so let's go over to the comparable sales. All right, so now, as I like to always do, is I'm going to go from high to low, okay? And what I'm looking for is some consistent, consistency here. And I see the 412. Let me see what the square footage is on this one. It's only 980 square feet. Okay, and all of them are fitted in there. These are some very small houses, but they're pricey. Okay, so I see uh, 282, 278, 278. That's all I need to see. Look how consistent it is. 274, 278, 278, 5, 282. I'm going to be in this range. I probably would just say 280 on this one. Uh, probably what I would roll with. Now, what you can also do, if you want to zoom in just in a certain area, like if you don't want to take in account uh, these properties across this this main fairway here, which is Ellerton Parkway. You can use the zoom in tool here, and what you do is you click, you click, click, and I'm gonna click again up here, and then I'll hit search. All right. So now what it did, it took away the properties across that main street there this main street and just only zoomed in on these. So now we're looking at 278, uh, 260, 252. So boom. So if you want to roll with that and say, look at it that way, then that will work also. I still will probably go with the amount that I, I mentioned before. Okay. So that's the deal on this particular property that that's in Nashville. So let's look at another one here. Okay. So we're going to look at one in Philadelphia, PA. All right, square foot 2621. All right, so I'm going to go to the detail. Well, uh, details here. And it's saying it's worth 340. All right, we see the owner's name here. And the address is the same. So they live there, owner occupied, as it said here. Okay, all right, so let me just look at a little history. Okay, so they purchased the property back in 2003, paid 272 for it. All right, so let's go over here to the comparables. And as I like to do, there's only five comparables on this one. So boom, boom, go to low to high. I'm sorry, high to low. Okay, and so what we got? We got 423, 395, 351, 333, 327. Now this has a little bit more distance between all of them. So um, the square footage, the house that we're evaluating the square footage is closer up here to this, uh, the first one, which is, uh, 2837 square feet. And this one is 2621. Okay. So I would probably say this property is, is at least worth 400,000 is what I would roll with. And the value that they're giving is 340. They're taking the bottom end of it, but I would probably say it's worth the 400. You know, I would go there. Uh, just because I got the data here to back it up. Uh, this this property is only 0.3 miles away. So that's just a couple of blocks. Uh, and that sale, well, that sale was in, in August of 2017, which is almost a whole year. So there's not a lot of activity uh, on this particular property. So, but that being said, you might want to take a closer look at the, the most recent sale. Now, this property is a little smaller as far as square footage, but at 327. So this number here is probably going to be a little bit more accurate than what I was originally thinking at 400,000 because this is one of the more recent sales versus this is all this is almost a year ago. Uh this is only 6 months ago. 
So I would probably roll with this. What they're showing right here is a 340 because that's what's probably happening in that area. But the one thing is that is there's not a lot of activity there as far as recent sales over the last year, which is fine, but you do have enough data there. Now you can always tap in here to the MLS listings and you can go over here to status. You can look at active and what uh, properties are listed for. You can see they're all jumbled up here. So it's quite a few here. It says 150. And you can get more detail by using the, uh, uh, by zooming in on it even more if you want it to. So, uh, that's always going to be an option. Uh, you can look at active. You can hit it again. You can look at sold. So you can also tap into the MS, MLS listings on it also. Okay. So now we want to get into the actual formula of ARV times 70% minus repairs minus your fee times two equals ballpark offer or some people say maximum allowed offer as i explained again in the beginning of this particular video is that this form is not the end all but it's more used especially for people that are new to prevent you from wasting time on something that has no chance of being a deal from my experience of dealing with students and non-students again uh, that's one of the more difficult things for them to understand what is a great deal Okay, so starting with the ARV, again, it means after repair value. And don't confuse the repair portion of that term as meaning what are the repairs. It's only, it only means what will the house appraise for once the repairs are re completed or when it's fixed up. Okay, so you take ARV times 70% minus repairs, which the repairs you may not know when you're having a conversation over the phone with a particular seller. So the way I would do it is just use 15 or 20,000. If you're wrong on it, it can always be adjusted because once you get beyond that 70%, you subtract, subtract the 20,000 and you want to ask the seller, what do they think the condition is? Which a lot of times they're going to over exaggerate how, how good it is or isn't or whatever. So if they say it's fire damage and the house is, you know, you say, what, what was burned in the house? Well, I say, well, only the kitchen was burned and that's still going to be 40 grand, you know, on a 1200 square foot house. Or whatever so if it's that extreme that's a whole different situation or they had a tree to fall through the roof or whatever then that's a different situation so uh with that being said we're just going to assume that the house just needs normal repairs we'll just say 15 to twenty thousand. so you want to always use twenty thousand. use it now the larger the house is the more it's going to cost to repair it so a 1500 square foot house is going to be less expensive than a three thousand square foot house okay all right, so so we'll just use the number twenty thousand uh, minus your fee times two equals your ballpark offer. As I some people like to say, maximal allowed offer. I just want to use the ballpark term because it's just a ballpark, you know. Because normally you're gonna to have to go low below that amount. Sometimes it'll work perfectly. A lot of times you're gonna to have to go below that amount. All right, especially if you're forced into making an actual offer versus trying to pull the price out of them. I like to always, that the way I teach it, the way I was taught it, is I want them to give me a price if all possible. Sometimes they won't do it, and you're forced into making an offer, and the rule of thumb on that, if you're forced into making an offer, especially if you've done this formula, you want to make an offer that you're embarrassed about. And normally it's going to be a lot less than that ballpark offer number that you come with up with with your total. And your goal is to pull out their least amount. Sometimes they may hang up on you. Fine. That's, they made it easy for you. Probably was, it, there was no deal there anyway. So if you do get them to respond, right, and they reject your offer, your follow-up question will be, well, how close can you come to that amount and wait on a response? And probably the number that they give you is going to probably be the number that is going to work for them. Now, if that number works for you, then so be it. You roll with it, okay? If it doesn't, thank them for the time. Let them know if anything changes and to give you a call back. Okay, so let's go through this formula. We're going to use for the sake of using the easy number so I can add in my head that I already done, I guess, is $100,000. So after this house is fixed up, it is worth $100,000. Okay, well, you automatically take the 70% times $100,000, which leaves $70,000. All right, we said the repairs are going to be $20,000. So you take that seventy thousand and subtract twenty thousand dollars in repairs, which will equal fifty thousand dollars. 
All right, now you have the $50,000, so you want to subtract your money. So you say you want to make $7,500 on this deal, and that's going to be totally up to you. You can say, I want to make $10,000 or $5,000, whatever the number is, but you have to be reasonable to understand that most of the meat on the bone as far as potential profit on this deal is going to have to be made by the investor in most cases, okay? You just, you, you're, you're, doing, you're having a volume play here because it's normally not going to take you literally no money to put this deal together versus the investor putting up several thousand dollars of his own money or someone else's money in or his combination of his credit or whatever involved. But normally it's just going to be a cash buyer, but it's still his actual money. Okay, so take 50000 and I times the 7500 times 2, that's 15000 and the ballpark offer is $35,000. So that's the formula in, in a nutshell. So we took the hunt just to recap it. We took the hundred thousand dollars, which is the ARV, times seventy percent, which equals seventy thousand. We have the seventy thousand, and we subtract twenty thousand in repairs equals fifty thousand. We take the fifty thousand dollars and minus fifteen thousand, which is your fee. You said you wanted seventy five hundred times two for negotiating purposes. A little bit more room. It's just fifteen thousand. Subtract so 15000 from 50000 that leaves a 35000 ballpark offer. So, what do you have here? You have an opportunity if they accept that 35000 So, you would normally go out to the house. Uh, this is all negotiated over the phone in most cases. I'd rather go out to properties and let the num unless the numbers work over the phone. Most of them are going to want more than make what makes sense. And what I mean by that is that you talk to 100 people, only probably five of those are going to be opportune. That's only 5%. But that may mean, depending on the market, that may mean $25,000 to $100,000 in, in deals in your pocket. So uh, even though the success rate of getting the price that you need to make a deal work is, is small, but the reward is so, so worth it, so worth it. So, uh, I think I went through it all. Uh, hopefully you, this all made sense to you. So you just want to show you an additional way of using Dealator, aka PropStream to, uh, as a tool to help you do this business, to help you make money. Uh, it's not going to do deals for you. No tool is. No list of, is going to do it, but they, they're only tools. They're just like GPS. GPS is only going to give you directions on where to go. You still have to drive there. I know we have the driver, the cars that drive themselves. We're still about five to 10 years away from that doing it, you know, in mass numbers. But for the sake of what I'm saying here, GPS is only a tool. You still have to drive there. Same thing with this. Degulator, aka PropStream is the only tool. You still have to do the work. This is just to help make it easier for you to get to a check. So again, if you signed up before, you dropped it, you might want to get back in because the rate is going to go up. Uh, but if you lock, you've already locked in, you're locked in at the current rate or whatever. But if you're serious about this business, you got to have something like this to make the business easier for you. It's just a drop in the bucket, especially after you start making money. So again, uh, hopefully this video helps and I'll see you on the flip side.